you are able, in turn, to face the cross of Christ. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we enter the fullness of worship, we are invited to set aside those things that separate us from God's love, and to remember God's gracious gift of forgiveness. Let us now enter into a time of confession. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Dear siblings, rest in this good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with his light that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the holy communion, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God is so with you. Let us pray. O God, overflowing with mercy and compassion, you lead back to yourself all those who go astray. Preserve your people in your loving care, that we may reject whatever is contrary to you, and may follow all the things that sustain our life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Just a few announcements for you all today. First, if you are visiting with us, if this is your first time or if you've been visiting um, with us a few times now and want to get more involved, there, there is a green connection card in the back of your pew. You're invited to fill that out. We'd love to uh, get to know you a little bit more and have you get to little, know St. John's a little bit more as well. A few more things for you all this morning. Just a reminder that our congregational retreat now is in two weeks, and it's not too late to sign up. So it's the weekend of September 23rd to 25th. We have programming for all ages, and we'll be up at Camp Luther Ridge that Sunday. It's going to be a great weekend, and please do join us um, and let us know if you're interested. Finally, today is our big fall reveal, and so you might have seen in your faith life this week. Um, if you haven't, you can check our website, but there are a series of videos that have been released detailing what our ministries are going to be like in this next academic year. So we invite you to take a moment to check those out and to join us. Today, our faith formation starts back formally, so we had a big kickoff for Sunday school uh, this morning between the services, and we'll have youth group and confirmation this evening as well. So if you are a youth, a middle schooler, or a high schooler, or if you know a middle schooler or a high schooler, you're invited to join us. You can see me for more information. Congregational sympathy is extended this week to the family of Rachel Seyfrit, who passed away late on Friday evening. Um, there will be a service with details to be revealed later. And now I'm going to take a moment to invite David Horde forward. David Horde is the chair of our annual campaign this year. Our annual campaign happens every fall. It's hard to believe that fall is upon us. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to be taking a moment during service to both celebrate the ministries of our congregation and to think about how we can invest in the future of those ministries. Thank you, Pastor. You guys look pretty good to be 275 years old now. I remember well the first time I walked into this space. Um, it was 1974. I was 21 years old. I'm not 21 years old now. I walked through that doorway. I was carrying a trumpet case. I was one of the brass players for Lenoran Choir. Bonnie was in the same group. We didn't know each other then, but we didn't know each other existed. But that, that changed. That changed, anyway. Uh, a few months ago, Larry Cartner tapped me on the shoulder, asked me if I would participate in the stewardship campaign this year. It's kind of hard to say no to Santa Claus. <laughs> so. so my name's David Hort, if you don't know me. Bonnie and I have been members here since 2014. But my association, my appreciation for what's been going on here for so many years. It goes back a lot farther than that, a lot further than that. This church has been an example of Christ's love in this community for many, many years, and I pray for many years to come. And I say this with gratitude, thanksgiving for the past, and with great hope and optimism for our mission in the future. We've been present in this community for 275 years, but God's mission for us and the task that we have to, to do, it's not complete. It's far from it. God's blessed this congregation with abundant resources. God has blessed us with an abundance of people who love God and who are seeking to do His will. God's blessed this congregation with financial resources that have been used to fulfill, his, to fulfill His will in this community and around the world. I believe with all my heart that we're called to use our talents and use our resources to continue and expand this work. This takes you and me and, of course, giving out of our abundance. At St. John's, our spending plan for 2023 will be based on our pledges that are received during our fall campaign. 
The coming weeks, you're going to be receiving a number of communications. You may have already gotten this one. I urge you to really read that well, study it over. But you'll get mailings, emails, social media messages, things of that nature. I'd like to extend an invitation to you to be a full participant in the life of this church. We have many opportunities. They abound for the things that we can do. I urge you to be attentive to those holy nudges that come your way, those nudges and prods that the Holy Spirit delivers to us. October 9th is Consecration Sunday, and I invite you to brunch downstairs in our fellowship hall. It's looking really good. We're asking that you respond promptly to the invitation that you'll receive in the coming days. I pray that God will continue to bless you bless us and continue to allow this church to be a beacon of hope and light in our community and the world. Thank you. reading is from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. In all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. 
And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Praise be to God. God. We stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning is from the 15th chapter of St. Luke. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners, they were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance." Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's been quite a week this past week, don't you think? I mean, certainly here at St. John's as we consider a, uh, the fall reveal, the beginning of a lot of fall programming, um, we began an annual campaign, and thank you, David, for your good words about and leadership through that campaign. 
Of course, the anniversary of 9-11, 21st anniversary of 9-11, the death, the death of a queen, uh, so much to, uh, to consider and go through. And oh, by the way, App State beats Texas A&M. How about that, huh? Pretty exciting. There's a classic story of Queen Elizabeth that's, that was told last June by her longtime bodyguard, Richard Griffin. Maybe you've seen it. It's gone viral uh, on, in social media. He was walking with the queen near Balmoral Castle. That's her retreat in Scotland. It happens to be where she died last week. Well, on the walk, they bumped into two hiking tourists. This is a true story. They bumped into two hiking tourists from the United States. He said that the queen always loved to stop and to say hello, but it was very, very clear from the get-go that, that these two men did not recognize the queen, had no clue who she was. So as they chatted, they said where they were from, where they had gone, where they were going to, and uh, then one of them asked the queen, and where do you live? <laughs> and she said, well, I live in London, but, but I have a holiday home on the other side of, of this hill. Oh, really? How often have you been coming here, they, they asked. And she said, well, I've been coming up here since I was a little girl, so well over 80 years, she said. Well, if you've been coming that long, have you ever seen the queen? <laughs> and quick as a flash, she points over to her bodyguard and says, well, I haven't, but, my, but Richard here, he meets her regularly. <laughs> you've met the queen, they asked him very excitedly. What's she like? And Richard said, well, oh, she can be cantankerous at times, but, but she's got a lovely sense of humor. And before he knows it, one of the Americans, he puts his arm around Richard's shoulder, gets his camera, gives it to the queen, and says, can you take a picture of the two of us? <laughs> After that, they switched places, and Richard took a picture of the young man with the queen, and, but they never caught on at all. As they waved goodbye, the queen said to Richard, I would love to be a fly on the wall when they find out who I am. <laughs> Clueless, oblivious, lost. Throughout this year, we've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke. It's, it's the story of Jesus, of course, but it's more than just the story of Jesus. It's a glimpse into the very character of Jesus. It, it answers questions like, uh, what matters most to Jesus? And what does Jesus value more than anything else? The answers are evident throughout the gospel story, of course, but they're most clearly revealed in the parables that Jesus tells. And Luke is filled with these parables, these stories of Jesus, because within them, uh, we find the heart and soul of Jesus, the Messiah. We're going to look at one of those stories today, the parable of the lost sheep. Next week, we're going to dive into the most familiar of the parables, probably the most familiar, the, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Both of these, of course, having to do with this idea of being lost. So it begs the question, have you ever been lost? I bet you have. I mean, these days, of course, on a road trip when your GPS isn't working properly, we get lost. As, as a kid, I remember getting lost in a department store, and I can still feel that panicked feeling in the bottom of my, my gut. Or maybe you've lost something, keys, a favorite book, your kid. <laughs> Once, once I lost my retainer when I was a camper at Lutheridge, I found it in the bottom of a dumpster at Lutheridge because I knew I could not go home without that retainer. So how many of you have searched and searched for something and were eager, eager to find it? Maybe you've been searching for your glasses all morning long, only to discover that they are where? On your head the whole time. This idea of being lost or losing things is nothing new. It's, it's just part of the, of the human experience. But you know as well as I that Jesus isn't concerned about losing your glasses. Jesus is concerned about losing your way. And so let's take a look. I'd love for you to open up your bulletins or your Bibles again today. We're in Luke chapter 15. And I, I want to look just at those first two, two verses real quickly. Are you there? So, verse 1, we're told that the Pharisees, they are grumbling with how much time Jesus is spending with the sinners. The Pharisees, of course, are the religious leaders of the day. Uh, one of the translations, the NIV translation, says that they were muttering. I sort of like that word. I imagine them muttering under their breath, saying things they didn't want to say out loud for everyone to hear. It happens all the time, right? To which our mothers would say, don't talk under your breath or don't say behind the back what you won't say to his face. 
But like the Pharisees, we do it all the time, don't we? I mean, we talk smack behind people's backs. We mutter unkind things to neighbors. We gossip with sentences that begin, did you hear or did you know? And social media, give me a break. We now have empirical evidence that shows how digital manipulation, which is essentially what it is, over time it changes us, it makes us angrier, it, it increases our likelihood of entering into a, a pattern of muttering and grumbling, of criticizing, of judging, of tearing down. And the thing is, anybody can mutter or grumble or criticize. It takes no skill whatsoever to do any of that, but it's no way to lead. In fact, several years after Jesus told this story, Paul, St. Paul, you know, was trying to establish a church in Ephesus. He gathered together the leaders together and said very, very clearly these words, quote, don't let talk that tears down come out of your mouths but only that which is useful for building others up. I mean, it's helpful advice for today, don't you think? Don't tear down, always build up. The Pharisees, they were trying to tear down with their muttering, tear down Jesus, tear down those that they didn't like, who they already had classified as the sinners. It's such a temptation, isn't it, to always tear down the other. So Jesus tells them a story. And this story is about a shepherd who has lost his sheep. Pretest, by the way, raise your hand if you think you know who the shepherd is. Come on, raise your hand. Anybody? Clue? Maybe? Jesus, I heard? Maybe. For now, let's go with that. Jesus, we know Jesus as the good shepherd. We've called him that for so long. There's beautiful imagery of Jesus as the good shepherd who cares for his sheep, who sets everything aside in order to find the lost sheep, even of course, when it doesn't make sense, because can we at least be honest about that? I mean, he leaves the 99 to fend for themselves just to find that one rogue, disobedient sheep, the same sheep who will probably just run off again tomorrow. It's reckless behavior, don't you think, among or, uh, of the shepherd? Careless behavior, inefficient, absolutely, but maybe that's the point. God's love for us is reckless. And not just us, of course, but for everyone, especially the least, the lost, the last, those whose society may have forgotten or ignored or, or have decided aren't worth it. In fifth grade, that person was Denise. I mean, Denise was the girl with braces on her legs and walked with a severe limp. She was awkward. Uh, she sat by herself at lunch. She played by herself on the playground. Her, her glasses were always crooked and she wore dresses when everyone else wore shorts. One day she had an accident while trying to climb a pole on the climbing set, meaning she wet herself. The ridicule was crazy. The laughter followed her the rest of the year. When Jesus says that the shepherd will do whatever it takes to find the lost sheep, I have no doubt in my mind that he had Denise's name on, on her mind. The girl uh, considered worthless by, by others, but but of great worth by the shepherd who is reckless in his search for her, relentless, tireless. Friends, if you, if you feel that you are among the least, the last, the lost, if you, you yourself, feel that your life is worthless, know that there is one who claims you as, as worthy, worthy to set aside everything, even his, his own life, to find you, to love you, to carry you home on his shoulders. Is that something you need to be reminded of today? Probably. We need to be reminded of that each and every day. Every morning when we wake up, when we put two feet to the ground, we need to be reminded, don't we, of, of God's reckless love for us. Or maybe you're thinking of someone in your own life who needs that reminder. If so, repeat this prayer after me. Ready? Lord, when I find myself lost from you, Lord, when I find myself lost from you, let me never doubt, let me never doubt that I am worth searching for, that I am worth searching for. Amen. But what if the shepherd isn't Jesus? I mean, after all, a, a parable is just a story, right? And any good story can have multiple meetings, multiple ways of entering into the story, multiple ways of interpreting the story. So, sure, the shepherd could be Jesus, and it's a lovely, a very important way of understanding this story, but perhaps he could represent someone else as well. And 
And sure enough, in this case, there's an interesting word in verse 4 that I had never noticed until this past week. So let's read it. Take a look. It says this. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Did you hear that? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. I mean, did you notice there's no mention of a shepherd? As it turns out, we're the ones who have added that word to the story. It's not clear in the story that, and never named as, as the shepherd, after G- all Jesus is speaking to whom? To the Pharisees, those who had been muttering under their breaths, judging others. Suppose one of you has lost a sheep, he asks. And here's another thing. We don't know who's responsible um, for the sheep having been lost in the first place. It's not at all clear in the story. Maybe it's a rogue sheep, uh, or maybe it's a careless man who left open the sheep gate. Maybe. Maybe the sheep has just carelessly wandered off, or maybe the one who was supposed to be watching over him failed to do his job. He was distracted, or he was just lazy. We don't know. And that's when the parable, though, starts to get hard when we at least ask those questions. Because suddenly, in asking them, well, I don't know, it feels like Jesus is, is asking us a question. Suppose one of you, he asks, individually, you, is responsible for someone or something being lost. Suppose one of you, as, as a society or as a community, is responsible for someone or something that, that has lost its way. I know, we don't like necessarily to hear those, those questions because all of a sudden, if we're not careful, suddenly it feels like we're being blamed for something. And goodness gracious, you know as well as I that we'll do whatever it takes to protect our pride. We don't like to be blamed for anything. Uh, but although Jesus is asking the question, make no doubt about it, his point here is not to blame but to ask, what will you do if you are responsible what will you do? Because at the end of the day, the shepherd always bears responsibility for the lost sheep. I mean, he can make all the excuses in the world. It doesn't matter. But when he brings those sheep back to the community at the end of the day and there's one that's missing, he's responsible. So what will he do? What will you do? One day I had to stay after class and talk with the teacher. We're back in fifth grade. (laughs) As I was leaving, Denise was standing next to the door. I didn't even know she was in the room, but she was next to the door, and and I could only imagine that she had been there waiting for me. I tried to brush past her until I heard her ask, why do you let them make fun of me? I was stunned. I wasn't prepared for that question at all. What are you talking about, I asked, and, and I have to admit to you, I honestly cannot remember the rest of the conversation, but that question has stuck with me all of my life. Why do you let them make fun of me? Suppose one of you knows of a sheep that is lost, Jesus says, what will you do? You would search for it, right? Jesus asked. Right? You would search for it, right? Or, or does that depend? Does it depend on what kind of sheep he's talking about? It is it one of his of of our own? Is it one of our of our own clan of our own tribe? Is it a sheep worth fighting for? A sheep who, when found, might draw the attention of others who will be eager to celebrate our bravery, our courage, and and pat us on the back? Or is it one of those lost, worthless sheep that no one even notices? <laughs> The thing is, Jesus doesn't tell us what kind of sheep. He just asks, suppose one of you loses a sheep, what will you do? And if you're honest, and I hope you will be, if we're willing to do some deep self-reflection and look into the mirror that is there before us as Jesus asks this question, we discover very quickly it's not an easy answer which is why Jesus shows us beautifully, drawing on the tradition of Moses and Isaiah, of Jeremiah and Elijah. Jesus says in verse 4, this is what you do. 
You go after the one who is lost until you find it. But how? Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is a, is a book that we've been, his book on leadership is something we've been reading together as a staff on Wednesday mornings during our, our, uh, our, our devotions. He's a British rabbi who draws beautiful connections to the great Old Testament stories, and every now and then will draw those connections to even the stories of Jesus. Well, in this case, when Jesus says, go, he does so with action in mind. That seems obvious, but it's very, very important with action in mind because, as it turns out, without action, you're simply a critic or you're just an optimist, a critic who complains that someone must have left that gate open or, or that the sheep must have been a lost case all along. Why, why should I be responsible? The optimist cheerfully says, oh, tomorrow will be a better day, <laughs> but does nothing to address the reality that the sheep is lost. Jesus employs the wisdom of the greatest leaders of faith, leaders like Abraham and Moses, Joshua and David. He doesn't simply talk about the sheep. Enough talk happens already. He does the hard work of searching for him. And in so doing, this person who was responsible for losing the sheep in the first place, well, now has been transformed into a prophet of hope not just an optimist. An optimist believes things will get better, sure, but the prophet of hope gets into the mess and makes things better. Go after the sheep and don't stop until he is found. And then place that sheep on your shoulders and bring him home. And then, friends, don't forget, celebrate like there is no tomorrow. Call together your friends and your neighbors and say to them, celebrate with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Who among you will do that? Jesus asks. I have to admit to you that I have felt guilty about Denise all of my life. I've been fortunate, and I know that I have been, very fortunate to have felt a strong sense of call into ministry because of people and events that have shaped my journey and the, and the Holy Spirit who has guided me to this place, and I believe that truly. But truth be told, I am also in ministry because of Denise's question. It's a question that I've tried to unpack for decades. The irony, the irony is that I felt that Denise was the lost one, but in truth, I was, and so often, I still am. But thanks be to God, Jesus has this beautiful way of reminding us that we have been drawn together by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the intention and purpose of God, that all of us drawn together as one flock, one family, and has shown me and all of us that He will do whatever it takes to find us, to rescue us, to hold us, to place us on His shoulders, and to bring us home. Finally, I just have to say that I I couldn't stand it any longer, so I looked up Denise this past week. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find her by her name, but also, and I'm not joking, by her crooked glasses. <laughs> what I discovered was that this lost sheep has now become a child advocacy lawyer in Charleston. One of the reviews said this, these words, quote, Denise fought so hard for my son then she even watched him grow up. I owe her my life. I will forever be grateful. Will you pray with me? Lord God, God, we know that your heart is for us all, but no doubt that you have a very special place in your heart for the least, the last, the lost. Lord, we confess to you that that sometimes we are lost in our own journey by our own making and sometimes not even aware of our own lostness. Lord, we know that there are so many folks in our community, in our midst, in our world who feel rather worthless or left, left on their own so alone. Lord, we thank You for Your heart. We thank You for Your eager determination, Your reckless determination to find even 
the loss that everyone else has forgotten. Lord, make my heart like yours. Lord, make our hearts like your heart so that you might use us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Gathered as God's people across time and space, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for the church, the world, and all in need. To you, O God, we offer you our praise and prayer, our worship and thanksgiving, even our very lives. For you alone are the God who saves, the God in whom we trust, and the one on whom we wait. Lord, in your mercy. On this anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, we pray for all whose lives were forever changed because of the hate-filled acts that left an indelible mark on our hearts. Give us fortitude to remember the lessons from that tragic day and move us to greater acts of kindness toward others. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the rain that has nourished our ground, yet your creation groans as millions suffer through excessive heat warnings and as others remain without safe drinking water because of climate crisis-related weather events. Renew in us the will to act responsibly to care for your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear the cries of your people, O God, as we join our prayers with those who look to you for peace and protection during prolonged periods of violence and oppression, particularly in the Ukraine. Strengthen the leaders of our land who work for peace among the nations. Lord, in your mercy. Fill us with inspiration, enthusiasm, and creativity as we begin our fall discipleship classes and ministry opportunities. As we enter into our annual campaign, help us to be bold to give as we have received abundantly, generously, and joyfully so that your kingdom here on earth will be strengthened through the mission and ministry of St. John's. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those whose lives are turned upside down, those lost in the midst of life. Be with the refugees of the world, those seeking safety in the midst of violence, people who long for healing or comfort and assurance of your presence. Give us not only eyes to see, but hearts and hands that find ways to care for those in our midst. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Eternal God, your love is stronger than death. We rejoice in the life of Rachel Seyfried and Jim Rabin, whom you have drawn into your internal embrace. We remember the royal family and all who mourn the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Keep us in joyful communion until the fullness of time when we are gathered around your table of great joy. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.